Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the MA Advisor. We are delighted you can join us. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation by using the question box on your screen. Our presenters will answer as many as possible during today's interactive virtual session. If you have any technical issues, you can contact us by using this chat box or simply hit help on the bottom of your screen. I'm Michelle Kokouris, a director in the research team at LCD, which is a division of S&P Global Market Intelligence. And I'm looking forward to an interactive and engaging afternoon with you today. I specialize in data-driven trend analysis and commentary on the leverage finance markets, focusing my efforts on showcasing developments and movements as tracked by LCD's S&P LSTA Leverage Loan Index, a widely used proxy for the 1.2 trillion leverage loan market. I'm going to start off by giving an overview on the lay of the land in terms of distress and pain points in the market by the numbers using S&P data before we turn over to our panel to dive deeper into the opportunities and strategies around distress debt. So turning to our first slide, so I think it will come as little surprise to anybody that we've seen a massive uptick in the volume of defaults by 244% to be exact to the same period of last year. Of course, the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact corporate earnings and the capacity to service debt. But what I think might be surprising to some is that less than 20% of this has actually come from two pandemic related situations or situations stemming from the April oil price plunge, at least when it comes to the leveraged loan asset class. How am I defining that? Well, companies marked single B or higher before the pandemic hit. Um, there are some gray areas to this that ex um, exist among companies that were already rated triple C um, beforehand, but the only one that would significantly move the needle being um, is heavily indebted Intel SAT, which they made mention of COVID in their court documents, but its, re its reasons for filing ultimately extended beyond um, the pandemic, namely needing to right size their balance sheet for C-band spectrum. So that's less than 9 billion of the 48 billion trailing 12 month volumes for August that are what I would term pandemic situations in the truest sense. So where does this leave us? Well, turning to my second slide, the, with default rates already at 10 year highs. By issue account, the default rate of the S&P LSTA Leverage Loan Index climbed to 4.31% in August, the highest reading since September 2010. The US speculative grade default rate at 6.2% is the highest since June 2010, and this is a preliminary figure. By amount, the loan default rate at 4.08% is at a high mark since February 2015. If we exclude energy future holdings and its outsized 20 billion default in 2014, the rate by amount would also be past 10 year highs. So moving to our next slide, in a quick look at where defaults are coming from within leveraged loans, oil and gas is significantly outtrending once again with 29% of all defaulted loans coming from this sector. Many in the industry, of course, have already tried to right size their capital structure in the past in an effort to ride out what would be a historic and sustained low price environment, only to come back for a second or third time, some regardless of the April plunge in prices. California Resources, which filed um, for Chapter 11 in July, had previously attempted a far-reaching exchange in 2015. Filled with Energy defaulted in May upon failing to make payments on its term loan just one year after emerging from bankruptcy. Ultra Petroleum also filed for bankruptcy after completing a distressed exchange in 2018, roughly one year after emerging from bankruptcy in 2017, so third time to charm there. In COVID specific defaults, we've seen well-known brands from brick and mortar clothing retailer, men's warehouse, 
restaurant group Chuck E. Cheese, Hertz, Cirque du Soleil, and 24 Hour Fitness, which join a nascent, at least within leverage loans, but growing list of companies that have endured a quick decline from the single and double B ratings bracket to bankruptcy or payment default. Um, looking ahead to our next slide, distress ratios and downgrades have historically proven an important forward indicator of future default activity. The, uh, the volume of loans priced below 80, which is an informal barometer of distress in the loan asset class, jumped to 672 billion at the height of the March sell-off, which in part thanks to the growth of leverage loans in general, outpaced the 2008 high by 40%. The distress ratio has since staged a dramatic rebound from the March 23rd 57% peak and March month end reading of 24%, this chart showing the month end readings, though it remains elevated by historical standards at 6%. Note, of course, while the distress ratio peaked at 81% during the great financial crisis, the loan market has since doubled in size. An 81% distress ratio in today's world would equate to almost 1 trillion of distress loans. We will talk a little more later on what this growth in the market means in terms of default volumes. But ultimately, um, is the loan market being overly optimistic? As we detail later, given the ratings deterioration of the loan market, the credit deterioration um, at the company specific level by several measures, and just a general uncertainty, it would certainly appear so, but I'd obviously remind this is a lagging indicator, so defaults are still to come. Um, loans, of course, are priced off higher recovery values, so as we look to our next slide, high yield bonds can offer a better indicator of how the markets are viewing the fundamental picture. Um, here, as we see in high yield, um, Distress volumes, we have a little over 113 billion priced in distress or 1,000 over treasuries. At the peak in April of this year, this reached 440 billion. Again, with the high yield market more than doubling in size since the great financial crisis, the April distress ratio peak of 30.6% is far below the 2008 peak of 77%, but that equated to just 365 billion of distressed paper. So there's a lot more potentially to chew on this time around, even with lower distress ratios. Um, turning to our next slide, where stress matters. Um, here, looking at sectors with a meaningful market share above 1%, and we're talking leverage loans again, um, across the sectors, Air transport now leads for sector level distress at 35.6%, which is this, um, the top blue line marking the most current levels. This sector had no loans in distress at the end of 2019, which would be the grey line you see on other sectors. Oil and gas previously taking the lead per the red line, which marks um, the April figure, now comes in second at 25.4%. Distress remains elevated in oil and gas in spite of um, the space of recent defaults that were flushed out of the calculation. Leisure and retail taking third and fourth have seen distress levels come down from the end of April, though this is more on account of default activity um, than lower distress in the industry. Leisure in particular saw a big jump from a minimal sector level distress at the end of last year. So to our next slide, um, in another forward measure, downgrades have outnumbered upgrades at a heady rate since the pandemic took hold. You can see in this chart heightened downgrade activity in similar vein to spiking distress typically precede a period of rising defaults. To that end, through August, nearly 40% of the loan market by par amount um, at the facility level had received a ratings downgrade this year. So that's 40%, which represents nearly 450 billion of the 1.2 trillion of index loans. That's a lot of loans downgraded. In the three month rolling calculation across March, April and May, downgrades outpaced upgrades at a staggering 43 to one. So 43 downgrades to every one upgrade. The ratio has since tapered off, but nevertheless, 
The post-COVID-19 downgrade cycle further weakened the quality mix of the leveraged loan market, with the share of index loans rated B- minus or lower at the corporate level swelling to nearly 33% by August, so a third of the loan market rated B- minus or below. And this compares to just 10.8% five years ago. Triple C or lower represented 10.3% of the index in August, compared to 2.97% five years ago. So we have seen um, a significant deterioration in the quality of the leverage loan asset class. So turning to our next slide, looking again um, across the sectors, Leisure, despite making up only a little over 4% of the loan index, newly tops the table for the most downgraded sector. The blue line showing um, the year-to-date number at 11.8% of all loan downgrades. Business equipment services and electronics by comparison are some of the largest sectors in the loan index, making up 9 and 14% respectively. And so their position on the chart is not um, entirely unexpected. Autos and hotels and casinos did not feature in the top 15 of downgraded sectors before the COVID crisis. They now have a downgrade share of 4.36% and 4.2% respectively. Um, so turning to our next slide, while price-based measures of forward metrics for future defaults may have come down significantly, second quarter earnings brought the first full pandemic picture of the damage caused by global lockdowns and months-long closures of non-essential businesses, and it's not pretty reading. Looking back at what was one of the weakest earnings quarters for corporate America, public filers within the S&P LSTA Leverage Loan Index, on average, reported a 23% year-over-year decline in EBITDA, exceeding the prior peak decline of 18% recorded in the first quarter of 2009. The blow to earnings leaves the credit markets in uncharted territory. Leverage soared to a record 6.4% on an average basis in the second quarter across a sample of loan issuers, up half a turn from the first quarter and adding considerable distance from the healthiest reading of the now derailed decade-long economic expansion or the 4.76 leverage reading in the final quarter of 2018. The resulting rise in leverage has a historic percentage of the index sample skating on precariously thin ice. As this chart shows, a staggering 35% of public filers, which LCD tracks in the loan index, carried a leverage of greater than seven times into the third quarter nearly double the proportion a year earlier and up from 14% at the cycle low for leverage in the fourth quarter of 2018. For reference, that outer edge proportion of highly levered credits was just 20% in the final quarter of 2008 and 16% a year later. So companies um, are certainly carrying much greater leverage this time around. While there's no way to sugarcoat these numbers, um, leverage companies are in a better position to service this debt than they were at the outset of the great financial crisis. With most defaults occurring before maturity, coverage ratios are an important indicator of a company's ability to maintain its debt. And with that said, 29% of issuers were operating with a cash flow coverage of less than 1.5 times a level typically indicative of higher default risk. In the final quarter of 2008, this was as high as 44%. Average interest coverage, though dipping to a seven-year low of 4.1 times, is a full turn better than where it stood in the third quarter of 2007 at the onset of the credit crunch. So in terms of, of managing this debt load, the companies are looking better this time around. And turning to the next slide, um, also potentially helping the near-term default landscape, companies um, are negotiating amendments and covenant relief to stave off um, a potential um, default wave, um, potentially less painful than initially feared. Um, or certainly we could see as a result um, a default picture of lower for longer. 
riding the coattails of the Fed's sweeping measures to prop up the capital markets, a record number of US companies sought breathing room on loan terms as falling earnings left them at risk of breaching covenants. Pro rata loans, which have not suffered the same deterioration in covenant maintenance packages as term loans, account for 93% of the 133 billion covenant relief volumes so far this year, compared to 42% during the great financial crisis. Um, what is this telling us? Well, it's telling us that despite the proliferation of covenant light within the term loan market, when it comes to maintenance covenants, companies are still being brought to the negotiating table via their revolver agreements. Though term loan lenders might not necessarily benefit from um, the increased economic terms. Um, looking at volumes, while covenant relief activity is less compared to the last crisis, we've seen a record 162 transactions through the first eight months of 2020, which compares to 154 in all of 2008. Of that 162 number, 152 occurred after the start of April. So turning to our penultimate slide, um, again, thank you, Fed. Many issuers over the last decade, and indeed in the shadow of the pandemic, have been able to considerably bolster their defenses against a downturn by tapping the debt markets in record numbers to extend maturity profiles and refinance at historically attractive funding costs. Uh, even some of the most hardest hit borrowers from the pandemic, including airlines, hotels and cruise, cruise operators, were able to tap investors for financing, sometimes paying double digit coupons to do so, though the conversation has moved on um, increasingly from liquidity preservation to terming out debt maturity profiles at progressively cheaper cost of funding. So the formidable um, maturity war now does not start until 2024, um, giving us some runway for companies to actually meet um, their full debt repayments. Though loan issuers um, bear a significant brunt of this over high yield. And then finally, um, to the final slide, I just wanted to round this off by highlighting LCD's annual recovery study. Um, of course, with defaults on the rise, um, recoveries are increasingly in focus, um, and there's a widely held expectation that for various reasons, loan recoveries in particular could be worse this time around, um, and we're certainly trending downwards. Using S&P's Lostats data, our analysis has found that newly added instruments across bonds and loans, um, I should say newly added defaulted instruments across bonds and loans last year, had an average discounted recovery rate of 66.3%. This has declined each year from 81% in 2016, notably as distressed exchanges decreased and bankruptcies increased. The average discounted recovery rate for bank loans as 74%, is down from a historical average of 80%. So in conclusion, I think the mass, uh, the fear of mass defaults is fading, but the numbers do not necessarily stack up. Um, street estimates for peak default rates have come down since the initial March panic, um, but they remain pretty high. So LCD, we conduct a quarterly survey of loan portfolio managers um, on their expectations of the default landscape and returns. And the results are still coming in, but an early read suggests that buy-siders are still expecting loan defaults will peak near 7% on a trailing 12-month on a trailing 12-month basis in this default cycle. Predictions back in our Q1 reads when the Fed support was still being rolled out. Um, range between seven and 9%. So um, not really a huge revision there. To put this into perspective also, when default rates um, hit a peak of 10.8% in 2009, the LTM defaulted amount was 63 billion. In today's market, it would require a default rate of only 5.4% to reach the same amount of defaulted loans. In high yield bonds, um, S&P Global Ratings Research still expects a US trailing 12-month speculative grade default rate um, of 12.5% by June 2021. 
So the silver lining here really is um, the unprecedented pace at which funding markets have normalized, which has helped to substitute cash, cash flows with debt. The key as always remains um, market access in this transition phase of the early cycle, given that this will determine the staying power to get to the other side um, of a recession. As we saw, cash buffers remain healthy for now, but increased borrowing costs cannot um, substitute, sorry, increased borrowing cannot substitute earnings indefinitely. And with that, let us continue with our panel discussion. I would like to turn this over to Alexander Gladstone, reporter with the Wolf Street Journal. Thank you, Rochelle. And uh, now let us continue with our panel discussion. And Rochelle, we look forward to you joining us for the uh, Q&A segment later. Uh, and a friendly reminder to our attendees, if you haven't submitted a question yet and wish to do so, please enter it in the question box on your screen throughout the session. Uh, I'm Alexander Gladstone. I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal uh, and WJ uh, Pro Bankruptcy. And I cover distressed companies, credit defaults, debt restructuring, and pretty much any, any time that a company is, is in trouble, um, either legally or financially. And so I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have the Honorable Kevin Carey, uh, who is a partner uh, in uh, Hogan Lobels, uh, their uh, U.S. business restructuring and insolvency practice. He is a resident in the firm's Philadelphia office. Judge Carey was first appointed to the bankruptcy court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania in 2001, and in 2005 began service on the bankruptcy court for the District of Delaware, and as chief judge from 2008 to 2011. Judge Carey is on the executive committee of the board of the American Bankruptcy Institute and serves as vice president of membership. Uh, judge Carey is joined by Perry Mandarino, senior managing director and co-head of investment banking and head of corporate restructuring at B, B Riley Securities. Uh, Perry Mandarino has advised several hundred companies over a 30-year career in corporate finance and has significant retail and consumer expertise. Um, anyhow, let's dive into our, our session. Um, so one thing I'd like to touch on is that while bankruptcy rates have been spiking amid the pandemic, and there's been you know, sort of a massive influx of fallen angels uh, amid the, the wave of credit downgrades. Both the, the total number of bankruptcy filings this year and downgrades uh, have actually you know, been less than people anticipated when the pandemic began uh, at its full uh, capacity, I guess, in, in, in March. And so part of that, I think, is that the Fed initiated it, its bond buying program under the CARES Act, and I, central banks around the world have been uh, taking measures to prop up struggling companies. And so I guess when you're looking at distressed investing opportunities, to what role do we think these kinds of um, monetary measures will continue and, and to what extent might they be unsustainable uh, down the road? So maybe Perry can weigh in on that. Sure, and good afternoon, everyone. And it's interesting because you've seen so many different industries um, that haven't previously been troubled all, all of a sudden have troubled the cruise lines, hotels, uh, and it's been a long time since hotels had a widespread problem. Um, certainly the, the PPP loan program uh, to a great extent, to a lesser extent, the Main Street loan program have certainly helped um, companies put off um, the uh, any formal type of filing. And what, what else is interesting is that this is not a problem of bad management by companies. This is not an issue of, you know, a widespread sector decline. It's, it's truly a once in a hundred years or more, I hope, uh, pandemic that has come along. And when you, it's not about cutting costs, it's about having people come in your store or your restaurant or being able to keep your manufacturing facility open or, or have people fly on an airplane. Um, it, it is so different that, that there's, the, there's the expectation of a recovery, of a swift recovery, maybe not V-shaped, 
but nonetheless, there's an expectation of a recovery. And I think that expectation um, is driving a lot of the, um, maybe the less activity in, in court than we would have imagined. Do you think that markets are, are baking in the possibility and in fact, seemingly likelihood of a second wave of coronavirus this fall and winter? Do you think that the market is, is baked it in or not? Uh, you know, it's maybe in certain sectors it has. I mean, but you you look at what just has gone on in in the Dow and the S and P and even the Russell. That I mean, you would think that um, that like everything's going to be okay, and you know the the markets usually view as what's going to happen in the future. You know, I think Americans are people of of you know, incredible hope and faith. And I think that there's views that um, with the good news that certain pharmas now are doing, you know, large scale testing. Um, and, you know, the, the, the spread has become um, maybe less in numbers and maybe in, in certain states it's higher than it was, but the numbers are not like they were in March and April. Um, and again, the government assistance is really propping it up. I, you know, I, in, in, in my view, the election could have over the next month could have as much of an impact as a second wave. Because of how that might impact central banking or, or what? Or how it may impact uh, consumer and business confidence, you know, taxes, the, the really the macro thoughts of what may happen, you know, post if there's a new administration or if the current administration continues. Will, will there be more riots in cities? Will it be, you know, will it be able, will New York be able to open back up again? Um, all those factors, I think, is why the election uh, is meaningful. There's well, so much is unknown about what, you know, what will be. I was speaking to a financial analyst recently, and I said to him, apart from what the epidemiologists are predicting with respect to the pandemic, with respect to the businesses that you're following, what are they planning for next year? For when the effects of the pandemic will uh, ameliorate a little bit and um, allow businesses to get back to, to the regular order of things. He said, many are planning uh, a recovery uh, from the, uh, well, not a recovery, but the beginning of, of a time to get back to normalcy in the second quarter of next year. What I didn't ask was, does that account for, you know, a resurgence uh, during during the colder weather? Yeah. Uh, but I guess if we're looking at the second quarter of, of 2021, it might very well account for that uh, for that resurgence. But in, in the end, nobody really knows, and it's the uncertainty I think that's the central dynamic right now of uh, you know what business planning is about. Yeah, and I think part of it is not just that there could be, or I guess it's likely to be a resurgence when people are, you know, inside more in the winter time. I think, I think, on a deeper level, it's that people's behaviors might fundamentally change, and people might get ingrained into certain habits even after they get vaccinated. One day, people might just have different ways of spending money or different ways of of living in the world. And for example. You know, a company that I cover very closely is AMC Entertainment, which is the world's largest movie theater chain. And eight months ago, AMC was a very healthy company. It was the world's biggest and best movie theater company. Um, now it's very, very distressed. And, you know, it has bonds trading at, you know, very, very low levels. Um, it really faces the, the, the prospect of a credit default. And the, the question is, even when people can come back to the cinema, I mean, now they are opening up their theaters, but, you know, there's still government, uh, uh, I guess, restrictions of how many people are allowed to come back in. And even if it weren't for those restrictions, how many people would want to sit in a closed room with no windows for, you know, two hours with a bunch of strangers? And even beyond that, when there's even when there's a vaccine, could people just have gotten more into streaming and people no longer really want to go to watch movies uh, in person anymore? So just... What I'm thinking about is it's not just whether we can go back to restaurants and bars or, or whatever in six months. It's will people's fundamental behaviors change, which could have 
serious ramifications for a lot of businesses, especially in consumer facing businesses. So yeah. I wonder what you guys think about that. Yeah, the sports entertainment. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's wild. You watch football games on, on Sunday and um, there's no one in the stands. Now being a New York Jets fan, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but, but nonetheless, concerts, I mean, concerts are, it's billion, it's a multi-billion dollar industry entertainment you know cruise lines as we talked about before vacations flying to europe um it's it it is so um fundamentally different than anything any of us have ever experienced i think as, as judge carrie said we're just you know trying to figure out and no one knows and we're trying to do things that are smart and safe yeah the distancing is is so antithetical to our cultural um uh, way of doing things. We are a society that likes to be among each other. Yeah. And, and that has been severely curtailed. Yeah. But it seems like what's happened, I mean, to me, what's happened, the fact the stock market has recovered so much, you know, part of it says to me that investors are banking certain kinds of high quality companies are going to be around no matter what. And so there's been sort of like a flight towards quality where, you know, people are putting their money into the, you know, S&P 500, like big, well-established companies that are going to be around pa after this pandemic. But so I'm wondering, is that, is that creating a dynamic where stronger, healthier, better companies get financing and companies that are sort of middle of the road are getting left behind and that could create further um, destruction? What, what do you guys think about that? Well, that's kind of the classic formulation of what happens in a downturn um, in any event no matter the cause of the downturn. Yeah. Um, and as Perry indicated earlier, you know, there are businesses that were managed well and doing fine, you know, but for the pandemic. And to the extent that these companies can survive for the duration of the pandemic or until, you know, a, a vaccine is, is um, widely available for distribution, um, the strong companies will be strong and the ones that, that haven't been strong or had problems before the pandemic um, will have difficulty. Yeah, I mean, but look at, for example, what Delta Airlines is doing. They publicly announced that they're borrowing, I think, six and a half billion dollars off their frequent flyer program. And they, and they think that will get them through the end of 2021. Now, you know, presumably they're thinking that's worst case. And so they're, they're funding towards worst case, but, um, and I was recently, I was on two flights since March started and, um, you know, it what was very odd is that Nashville airport was busier than Newark airport in terms of just number of people. And, and it's a matter as Judge Coward was saying, it's getting to, it's just having enough resiliency and liquidity. So behaviors changing and behaviors changing with the institutions that hold the debt because there's there are, you know a lot of cash flow businesses if if they if the lenders were to just decide to foreclose then you know it's what cash they have and perhaps what you know maybe some receivables they have um there's not good answers so the best answer there is is right now is patience and um and and the, waiting for the uh the tide to turn permanently yeah well, that, that brings me to my next question, which is we've seen this is about the timing of the distress cycle uh, and looking out in, into the future. You know, after the, the pandemic hit, there was sort of a wave of companies, the ones that were able to do so, tried to raise as much debt as they could to sort of tide them over. And so AMC did that, as I, as I mentioned. I mean, a lot of companies were able to sort of get investors to buy in, bank or bet on our recovery put money into us now and then three years from now, you'll you'll get paid out and it'll be a good investment. So this resulted in sort of a debt binge. I don't know the exact exact number, but I believe there is a massive uh, uh, issuance of, of new debt, especially senior debt um, over the past six months. And so this means that there's gonna be debt maturing uh, years down the road, which there's probably going to be a, a maturity wall that's going to hit a few a few years from now, so that it might postpone this distress cycle, but it doesn't resolve it. So, what do you what do you think about that? I think the um, it, it's a good point, Alexander, because the the amount of new issuance of say CLOs 
right? Yeah. Every week it gets higher, right? Billions of dollars and it just gets higher. Um, so there's liquidity in the market, which is a good thing. And I think we're in just a cycle of um, there will be extensions or perhaps in three years from now, say, or five years from now, if there isn't a permanent recovery, then that's when the world will really change. So maybe that's why the market is being optimistic, because they know for the short term, call it a year, there seems to be enough support. And what happens down the road? What happens with, you know, again, the macroeconomic issues of taxes and trade? And what happens with trade and what's going on around the world? I mean, it, it is not, we are in such a global economy that, and, and, and the other unusual part about this pandemic is that it's affected the world, right? It's not just limited to the United States and Europe or the money centers. I mean, it's affected everywhere. Um, and uh, it, is, it is patience, something that a lot of people in finance aren't very good at. Now, in your, and this is directed to both of you. Uh, do you find that many of your clients on, on the cre on the investment side, on the buy side, I, I presume that many of them have been lenient and have granted amendments and waivers and stuff like this to sort of, hey, say, hey, I, I understand there's the pandemic. Of course, the reality is different now. I'll give you guys, a, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys waive those maintenance covenants for the next, you know, 12 months or whatever. I presume that both of you have clients who have been lenient about this given given the circumstances. But do you think that they may ever come to regret that? Well, okay, so let me say something about the maturity walls. You know, in our business from time to time, yeah. we see the walls and we say, what the heck is going to happen when we reach that time? And it, it never it never ends in disaster unless there's something else. Okay. And in this case, you know, maybe if the pandemic effects hang on. Uh, that's the something else. Um, you know, we've had times when, you know, there's been a 9-11, that's the something else. When we had the 2008 uh, financial system collapse, that's the something else. So, you know, the maturity walls tend to seem to move um, unless there's one of these other forces that, that comes to play. Hmm. But yeah, you know, in terms of what will happen, you know, in a year or will the Will people feel differently about how they should be investing or lending? And the answer is it depends. You know, it just depends. And and again, you come back to the thing that Perry said that the many businesses were, were fine and will be fine, you know, whether it's in 2021 or or 2022, uh, when they finally get rid of the effects of the pandemic. But um, the other part of it is again what Perry said is that. You know, we are an incredibly optimistic people. Um, you know, we have this view, rightly or wrongly, that there's nothing we can't do when we put our shoulder to the wheel. Uh, and so that keeps things going. I mean, I, in part, that's, I think, a reason for sometimes stock market volatility. You know, it's, it's an emotional thing because, you know, a company doesn't change overnight necessarily, but um, all of a sudden enterprise value is for, for a reason that you couldn't really understand. True, but how does that play into different sectors, though? Because there are certain sectors that are pretty clear are going to make it through this crisis. Other sectors may, may not. So it's not an evenly distributed. Okay. I, I agree with you. We are an optimistic people, and investors do have a long-term view of that you know we are going to bounce back one day. But not every sector is going to survive. And, and you're seeing the, the, the coal sector is it was they, they were already in trouble well before, but now they're just it's really a, a truly a dying industry. Um, and I guess I think I spoke with Perry earlier, and what we're seeing is that, you know, while distress has been concentrated amongst energy and retail for the past few years, now we're seeing that this pandemic has created a whole uh, new set of sectors which are distressed. And for example, Hertz, Hertz Rent-A-Car, it, it wasn't the healthiest company in, in the world, but no one thought they were going to file for, for bankruptcy. Uh, until the pandemic hit. So we're seeing sort of new sectors we didn't really anticipate before getting distressed. And I, I just wonder how, what do you guys think about um, how investors are looking at these different segments and, and how they can maybe find opportunities in them? Well, and Hertz was so optimistic, they even thought about having an equity raise until the <laughs> SEC told them no. <laughs> in bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was one of the unusual uh, things that I've seen over time. I, you know, I think um, I 
I think that there will be um, a rebound in those industries that are being affected by by top line, you travel, vacations, a- entertainment. And it's a matter, maybe entertainment's in different steps, like AMC may be different than a con than you know filling up MetLife Stadium with you know eighty thousand people for a Springsteen concert, um, and will be different than going back to vacation to Europe or the or the islands, the Caribbean. Um, so I think there will be a slow step. I think when a vaccine comes along, I think it will it will be incumbent on people to take the vaccine and you know there have been some polls out there like 30 percent of the people are saying we're not going to take because i don't know what's in there it hasn't been tested the way it, a normal drug would be tested i mean there's so many curveballs and to your point before alexander like habits right you know human beings are great adapters right at the beginning of the pandemic i hated having to work from home Right. And it was just, it, you know, your lifestyle changes, but then you sort of, you know, you get used to it and, and you, you become efficient and you're getting deals done. Um, and, you know, going back to it, I think it's, I think it's necessary. I can't wait to, to go back to the office um, and see my colleagues as, as, you know, judge said, it is, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're meant to be around people. We're yeah. meant to interact. And, um, you know, it will, what what's incredible about all this is that how well you know business is still doing right other than those that are just affected by people that that you know there's no people in hotels and renting cars but yeah. business is staying solid it's strong um we're getting we've gotten two m a deals done during the pandemic about to get two more done in the next few weeks it's incredible. And these are real businesses with real, with real dollars and real employees and jobs are being saved and there's growth. They've got a way to manage through this pandemic. Right. Yeah. I guess another thing which I've been thinking about is just, you know, in many ways the pandemic created massive opportunities for certain kinds of startups. Like I think, I mean, Zoom obviously uh, is, I guess, probably the most well-known and famous, um, uh, I, I call it a success story of the pandemic, but what other kinds of innovations are you seeing or companies are finding ways to offer new products or services that meet the, the demands of the moment? I mean, that's another way of looking at distress opportunities, finding those who can, you know, either rise from the ashes or, or find new ways of doing things given the current paradigm. So I'm just curious, you know, if you guys have been looking at that. I think one of the new ways of, doing business is going to be maybe a movement away from the just-in-time inventory system, hmm. which we've been operating on for a long time now. Because um, what happened when the pandemic struck is that were shortfalls that manufacturers were not designed hmm. um, to deal with because there was no inventory. I think you're going to start seeing some of this real estate that may end up um, having to reconfigure because of the loss of tenants end up offering some warehousing space, you know, um, there was an article, I think it was in the journal, uh, about, uh, paper towels, you know, they're not stored because they take up too much darn room, but you know, people need them and want them as we found out. Yeah. Uh, just one example of how things may change in that respect. You know, it takes two months to get a fridge now from, from General Electric. And I'm speaking from experience, by the way. It's got a new fridge. That's because they're, the factory stopped. That there's, they're just everything's back ordered. So, but so your point is that this might change how how companies view their supply chains, and how, how might how might they make improvements? What what do you think that could the be, could the the outcome be in terms of of the change that they make? It's carrying less inventory, and I've seen it among retailers right now, you know, inventory management and um, working capital management. Mm -hmm. And it's been phenomenal because they, in a couple examples of clients that I have, they have less inventory, but their margins have gone up, Mm -hmm. right? Because they're effectively managing what they're selling. It's it's I I, I think supply is is mean, right? I'm sorry. It's 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 a leaner, meaner operation. And that's right, and and I think it's going to provide innovation and efficiency. I think transportation may change, right? I think you may see you know airlines going to smaller planes and you know a a you know just different patterns. 
um, I think energy may change because just the lack, you know, it, it could it could really be a catalyst to more efficient energy because there, you just don't need all that oil anymore. Yeah. And almost in, in every, in every aspect. And, and then you have construction, uh, you know, it has been said America's infrastructure is pretty bad. And, you know, the, just the type of road work that I've seen because there's less people traveling, um, you know, when the government, you know, when, when the federal government makes changes and they want to pump up the economy, they generally start right with infrastructure. And I think you could see America's infrastructure getting a lot better. Well, let's see what happens after the election. I think the <laughs> promising infrastructure week the whole four years. So yeah, there's that E word again. Yeah. Interesting. But um, and in terms of like distressed investing opportunities, you know, the, the key time to invest or to make a distress opportunity is when something gets oversold, when when something when a company seems like it's having a major problem and you know, the bonds and the stock and loans all drop and then it actually gets oversold a bit and then people can buy that dip and recognize the value inherent in the company. But do you think that moment may have passed? I've heard that there's been some major distressed hedge fund managers who said that the key time to buy stuff was back in like March and April right. when the market was in, in a frenzy. Could it be that the, the moment to buy cheap uh, but valuable companies has has passed, or it just we need to look at it differently now that we're on a bit more, a bit further down this pandemic cycle. Well, it's it's passed for now, um, Alexander. Uh, you know, back at the end of March, I think you know the CS loan index. It was, I think, it reached its low when it was like seventy six, seventy seven. That was the average price of of paper. And so you had double B credits that were trading in the high 70s, low 80s. The yield on that was enormous. Now I think it's it's back up to, you know, it's in the 90s, it's in, in the low 90s. So yeah, do I think at back in March was the time to, to buy some of the paper and, and there were some great returns by those hedge fund managers? Absolutely. Um, it's a cycle. And, and, and maybe I think that's the point is that there's always cycles, right? We've seen it where, you know, Judge Carrie and I are old enough to have been through many of them. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but the cycles now may be shorter, right? We went from March to, to, to August where it was low to high in terms of the, 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 the prices or September, the prices of bonds or the prices of, high, of, of uh, leverage debt. And maybe that cycle is going to happen not another year, but it's going to happen in another six months again. So it's opportunistic. It's it's looking at fundamentally good companies. Yeah, I think it's a good point that the cycles that we've seen historically won't be the same cycles anymore. I, I agree. There'll be a different different um, time time frames between them. Now we've touched a bit on. I guess industrial innovations or an operational innovations uh, amid the pandemic. But what 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 do you guys think about um, have financial innovations also occurred during the pandemic? I haven't done the research on this, and I'm sure other people have. The, the, you know, the the growth of private lending, um, SPACs is now a big thing. Special purpose acquisition companies. Would you say that the pandemic has driven any? new trends or developments in financial innovations and, and uh, new new practices in this in this field yeah, sure i think i think the the you know commercial regulated lenders um are being very careful as to the loans that they're underwriting they're under pressure from the occ um i think yes specialty lending there's been again tens of billions of dollars raised uh, by specialty lending company SPACs, which, you know, my firm has been involved with for the past three years. I mean, we did two SPACs on our own for our own balance sheet. I mean, they are an incredibly good tool um, that investors like because there's some real hedging on how, on on making the ultimate investment decision. Um, so absolutely, there's, there's new things that evolve. And, you know, when we look back in three years from now as to this time, um, you know what's happening it's like technology right what happens in such a short time frame is extraordinary compared to um you know what what's ha what used to happen in business cycles judge carry i agree i agree 
Well, listen, um, it has been a pleasure talking with both of you gentlemen, and um, we will now transition to the question and answer period. So I, I hope that um, the audience or members of the, of the audience have submitted questions and we can take a look at those and um, weigh in on them. All right, so now moving on to questions. Um, this one is directed towards Rochelle. And the question is, what do you think accounts for your expectations of lower recoveries and distress? Yeah, yeah so it's a good question. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, the same aspects that have mattered in the past will continue to do so. So subordination, um, debt cushion, the time of the cycle and, and sector within collateral um, to recover, leverage, time to default. But this time around, you know, I, th I think we have um, some significant differences. So um, CLOs now make up um, a significant amount of deal allocations compared to during the last crisis. Um, and Covenant Light as well, um, a significant amount of the loan market um, is made up of Covenant Light loans compared to um, in 2008, I think it was somewhere around 15% compared to around 80 this time. So, I mean, we've seen that lenders are able um, to be brought to the restructuring table, but how much um, leveraged loan lenders will benefit from this remains to be seen. So, you know, so, uh, there's a lot of... Um, moving parts when it comes to recoveries but I, you know the expectation is this time we could expect recoveries to be somewhere around 10 point 10 points back of um, the historical average and um, so we're looking at probably 65 to 75 on average um, but yeah the, the typical um, the typical aspects uh, continue to play out probably how far out have you modeled that you're just saying 65 percent recovery is what for companies that restructure now or over over what time frame um over the um the downturn so for this next default cycle on average i mean it's not a hard hard and fast number um i'd have to look to see on the rating side if we've modeled that but that's generally kind of a, a feedback that we hear from the markets um, so how, does that to, uh, how does that compare to the, the uh, 2008 2009 crisis uh, I'd have to look at the data, so I'll come back to you on that. But um, I didn't. We'd still imagine it to come in lower, so um, I'll come back to you on that one. Good. Okay. Now we have a question for Judge Carey regarding cross-border insolvencies, um, and the question is: you know, given this is obviously a global pandemic, have you seen an uptick in cross-border? Uh, insolvencies or or and or do you expect those to uh, you know what do you anticipate for the future in, in this this regards well as we all know business has gone global um, and as a result uh, many companies have operations or assets or property in number of different jurisdictions um, we've been counseling a number of uh, foreign clients uh, on the multiple choice of where do you file your main proceeding and where do you file one or more ancillary proceedings? Um, and are the jurisdictions we're talking about, uh, do they subscribe to the model law, the US chapter 15, uh, or don't they? So the I will tell you the exercise of um, having to figure out the proper venue is really a challenging one. And because our, our firm is global, we, we do we do face this routinely. Now, there haven't been that many filings yet. I think the clients are basically, you know, give us give us a plan if we need it. And that's one of the things we have been doing. I think Aeromexico, that was a pretty well-known um, cross-border case. What other major uh, cross-border or chapter 15s have happened since the pandemic? Chapter 15, um, uh, none come to mind especially, but uh, you know, Latham filed, you know, foreign airlines seem to like the US, chapter yeah. 11. Yeah. Uh, that's um, not an unusual thing. Uh, and I think other, even other companies which are foreign based might very well prefer a chapter 11 um, because of all of the tools in the toolkit it offers a company. Um, 
you know, the interesting thing is, you know, because of the recently enacted uh, European directive, uh, EU countries w have been in the process of changing their insolvency laws to provide more Chapter 11-like features. Hmm. So when they're fully in place, that could also impact the exercise of, of where a company is best to file. And Virgin Atlantic was a large Chapter 15 that filed in August. Yeah. To your point, Joe. Yeah. I have, I have a question coming in for Perry. Um, which regards consumer spending um, uh, in regards to government aid. I know that I guess Congress is now stalled in a second round of stimulus, but um, what do you anticipate in terms of consumer spending as the you know the money from the CARES Act runs out? And could there be another round of stimulus? And if not, what would the ramifications be? Sure. Well, you know, it's interesting. The jobs report last week that came out, the number of new jobs that were uh, – that, that, that hit were less than expected, but unemployment was also down, was lower than expected. So unemployment, which was, you know, I think it's a little over 8% right now. Um, if unemployment holds at that level, at the same time that um, stimulus runs out, I think you'll, you will see a negative impact on consumer spending. Um, I think consumer spending has been strong, as you can see, by a lot of the comp store sales that, uh, reports that, that companies have announced. Um, but without stimulus and without the, the reopening of the doors um, or, or the closing of more doors, it will be difficult to maintain that consumer spending, which could have a ripple effect post-Christmas or post-holiday season. So you anticipate maybe another round of retail bankruptcies the, the ones that are, are still standing or <laughs> you know it's um uh, retail has my whole career has been you know going back 30 years plus retail has oh i've always worked on retailers retail has always been a sector that's been troubled um that that there are bankruptcies um but sure depending on what happens over the holiday season uh, and further store closures or forced government mandated store closures, then yes, I could see another wave of retail bankruptcies absolutely happening post January. And Judge Carey, you you know over your many years of either working in the courts or I guess on both sides of the bench, you know what is what does your gut tell you about how busy the courts are going to be over the next? Well, I think well the courts are busy now, although the number of Chapter Eleven filings. Um, you know, rises and falls month to month. Uh, I think the trend is upward, and I think it's going to continue to be upward. On the consumer side, um, there have been very few filings, actually, because of the government help. Although I think courts are anticipating that when that runs out, there will be uh, a real surge in consumer filings. Um, you know, the one thing I'm looking at, at interest for is back in the Chapter 11 to see what effect that the new subchapter five uh, part of chapter 11 will have that was passed earlier this year uh, and to cover small, medium sized enterprises. The CARES Act expanded the eligibility, debt eligibility up to I think seven and a half million dollars, mm -hmm. um, which really would make it make eligible, and it's a voluntary election, they would make eligible the large majority of chapter 11s that are filed um, that may encourage more businesses to to try eleven rather than to either just seven. Yep, exactly. Have you seen like so? You uh, this this was passed as part of the CARES Act. You said right? Or well, the, the, the statute Act. was passed before uh, it became right. effective in February of this year, and then when um, the pandemic hit, uh, Congress expanded the debt limitations uh, as part of the CARES Act, which was a good thing. It was. Temporary, it only is effective for a year, but okay. I think there are hopes that uh, it will be extended after that. Have you reviewed any data that shows that there's already been an impact, that more small businesses have been opting to file an 11 instead of a 7, or it's too early to extrapolate any data from that? It's too early. I mean, the, the, ma the major fight that came right away was, well, uh, the CARES Act said that if you're a debtor in bankruptcy, you don't qualify <laughs> for the... Uh, for the uh, extra aid you'd get. So that was really one fight that was had early on with um, with the small businesses. But I, I, I haven't reviewed the filing numbers 
on the subchapter five filings. Um, but mm -hmm. hopefully that data will be meaningful soon. Well, maybe let's we can we can reconnect about that at the end of the year and see if there's anything we can draw from it, and maybe I'll even have an article. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, any other questions coming in from the audience? Let's see. Uh, what else do we got? Um, let's see. Do we do we expect that retail restructurings, the trend of retail restructurings, converting businesses from brick and mortar into, into online or online only. Is that a trend that we expect to continue? I mean, I guess Perry can weigh in on that. Yeah, yes. Um, you know, in fact, we just closed the deal that was announced on uh, Thursday. It was the, uh, the Retail Wins uh, Inc. Uh, bankruptcy, the New York and companies, the brand and fashion to fitness. Um, we, the court approved the sale in early September and we closed on October 1st, whereby you know, you know, unfortunately, about 350 stores were closed. However, the e-commerce business was sold. Um, you know, really good enterprise value, good people behind it, keep keeping 100 plus people employed. And it's a great brand. And you see the the brand companies, the um, the Blue Star Alliances, the ABGs, Marquee of the world out there aggressively buying, buying brands out of bankruptcy from, you know, BCBG to Barney's to uh, Brookstone. Um, yes, I expect that to continue as the delivery system improves um, even more. One of the interesting developments is the purchase of retail brands and stores by mall, mall owners. Um, I'm curious to see uh, how they will do uh, in, in this attempt not to lose tenants. Yeah, I've been covering those. There's Simon Property Group, which has bought a lot. I guess they bought Forever 21 Lucky Brand Jeans. And now they have a pending deal to buy J.C. Penny, And they've teamed up with this authentic brand, which is sort of a branding right. company on a number of the deals. I forget which ones. But um, it's a huge bet on. It's basically Simon is the, I guess, America's largest mall operator, and they're buying up a lot of their own tenants. So it's just a massive bet, I guess, on the future of the American shopping mall. And we'll see how that bet worked out, I guess, in a few years from now. But it's. Well, it started with Aeropostale. That was their first. Um, that's right. That's right. That was the first one. I think the company's known as Spark. Um, that they have that ABG has formed with uh, with Simon, um, and it's a it's a great theory. I mean, you um, you know, like Burr said to Hamilton, you're adored by the by the by what you create, and mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's a it's an incredibly um, it's an incredibly creative. And well thought out of idea where they can use the scale and expertise of, of omni channel, as you hear that term, in order to ensure long term success. So, you think that it's, this is going to be a bet that's going to pay off, or do you think people will just stop going to shopping malls at some point? Yeah. Well, you know, Alexander, I don't think um, it's going to be limited to Simon doing that. I, I mean, yeah. I'm aware of other landlords, um, different types of landlords that are buying up brands. Um, to or buying up reta other retail concepts or trying to buy the retail concept concepts in order to fill some dead space that they may have or, or anticipate having over the years. Um, I don't know if the mall could be dead. I actually was in a mall yesterday and it was the first time I was in a mall since March or I guess March. And really? it, was, it was weird. It was a lot. It was it's usually a vibrant mall and it was a lot less. It was empty. Not all the stores were open. Um, you know, Cartier had a line to get, and not a line. It you had to make an appointment to get in. So there's all I noticed that, and so it's all different, and it's um, uh, it's a different world we live in. But um, so we talked about before humans, where people were resilient, and normalcy will come back at some point. Well, the um, the one of the efforts in retail recently has been to make your visit to the store what they call an experience, right? Um, and to the extent malls will be able to once again provide an experience, um, my guess is that, again, given our socialization uh, culture, uh, people will want to get back to them, um, but they're not going to want to walk through a mall with half the stores closed, I don't think. Yeah. I guess they can do mini golf. They can, there's, there's things they can do, but... Um... 
Yeah, we'll we'll see. I mean, this is you know, like like I guess now things are strange because of the pandemic, but we'll we'll see during you know as things open up. Hopefully, uh, people will hopefully want to come out and be in public again and go shopping like they used to. But I don't know if they will. We'll, we'll have to see. So it's been a pleasure chatting with you guys. I think that we're out of time. Is any last minute questions? Um, but it was a pleasure, and um, oh, you know what? I got one, one last one last question. I want to get. To, I'm gonna ask this one. Um, the Main Street Loan Program. How effective has this been? To to date, it's been relatively ineffective. There's, I think, something like one or one and a half percent of the funds that have been put aside by the government have been actually lent out. The, and the reason is, is that the underwriting process, it's it's as if you're doing the banks are doing a normal loan. So the the what's called the you know the participating lending institutions uh, institutions have to underwrite the loan as if their own criteria because that the OCC puts out and how it gets rated. A lot of these loans, if if the banks were to close on them, they'd have to take the banks themselves would then have to take an automatic hit based on the OCC underwriting standards. So um, I know there's solution to that. I'm sorry. Is there is there a solution to that or, or what? Uh, um, better legislation? I know there's been as part of the um, the continued negotiations in our um, in the hallowed halls of Congress that they're they're talking about um, the Fed especially is pushing for some relief because if you're a company whose top line was affected because of the pandemic, right? Of course, you're not going to be able to meet underwriting criteria if your top line is down by 50%, although it's temporary. I mean, you know, think of an amusement park, for example, or a, um, a, a chauffeur limo, limo company or, or something that or movie theaters, to your point before about AMC, right? They'd be perfect for a loan like that because it's to get you through, it's to get the company through the next step, and it's to get the company through um, – uh, the pandemic, but if banks can't underwrite it, it's you know it's so. Hopefully, our uh, our 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 legislators will fix that. Well, if they do make the loans, I think the fear may be that uh, all of a sudden they'll have a whole new portfolio of bad loans. Um, if it turns out um, that the lending decisions uh, weren't weren't good ones, and I think the banks are concerned about being criticized for that, if that should be. Um, if that should come to pass. Based on the current standards. That's exactly right, Judge. It's sort of like saying, don't take this medicine. It could make you sick. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, I think that's all the time we have for today. So it's been a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to catching up with you guys, hopefully in person when it's possible. I remember uh, it was great fun at the M&A Advisor Conference in Palm Beach, the three years I was able to go there in person. And so I hope, hopefully next February, we can be back there in Palm Beach again. So um, let's just cross our fingers for that. And either way, we can talk, you know, on the phone or offline or whatever. So let's, let's catch up soon. And thanks to everyone for dialing in for this, uh, this panel. Thanks, Alex. Take care. All right.